Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. We're your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today is entrepreneurial executive Lee Poskanser. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. We are so happy to have you on today's show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. So before we jump in, I was hoping, Lee, that you could tell our listeners just a little bit about your background, your company, and what it is that you do. Uh, I am, uh, by nature, a marketer and a product person. And back in 2013, when I was working in the gift card industry, uh, I was working with a friend of mine who uh, worked for Fandango gift cards. And he suddenly passed away very unexpectedly at a very young age left behind a wife and two children. And about three months later, I went on to LinkedIn and I got a message asking me to congratulate Jim on being a ski instructor back up in New England. Without thinking about it, I actually picked up the phone and started to dial Jim's number. And I realized Jim was dead. Most people didn't know that. And so I thought something was a little awry and uh, wanted to know why did LinkedIn still have Jim up there and still sending out messages. So I started contacting lawyers and wealth managers and other people learning about handling a person's death online. And I quickly learned that there was a huge problem, not only for financial matter, but for legacy matter and for just even pure governmental matters. And so I did even more research and decided to start the company known as Directive Communication Systems, also known as DCS and helping people plan their online accounts and their digital property for succession purposes. And so I've been doing that for about 10 years now. We have a team, uh, we have offices in the US and in Canada, and we continue to grow and expand just like the digital asset market. So walk us through as a, as a client, what does that process look like in getting all of this done and organized through your program? From a client's point of view, uh, we, the client is enrolled by a law firm or a financial advisor. We partner with those entities. We are not really a referral service, but we participate in an ongoing relationship with them. Once the client is enrolled with some very basic information into our platform, we begin to reach out to them and help them build their portfolio of accounts. What we've done is we've made it a very easy process by automating the account deposit and the asset recognition so that the client can quickly add, let's say Dropbox, and they can identify the assets within. So they can identify pictures or stock certificates, investment statements, or important documents itself. And what they can do is they can designate who is to see the contents, go through it, and who it should be passed on to. When we gather all the overtime, it's as our product is a subscription-based product. So we stay with the client for the duration of their life. They continually add new accounts, new assets as they see fit. You know, years ago, cryptocurrency wasn't very big. We see more and more people adding NFTs in crypto, or other blockchain assets. So we stay with the client for the duration of their life. And then when the time comes, we have to do administration or trust settlement. We partner with the representatives and carry out the directives so that they can be fulfilled. The information can be passed on. Pictures and videos can be passed on to loved ones. Financial matter can be settled settled and distributed appropriately. And other accounts such as dating profiles, uh, et cetera, may be closed and handled in the manner that that the client sees fit. So does this cover, does this include things like a LinkedIn profile, social media things like Facebook and Instagram, are all of those part of this program as well? Absolutely. Everything from social media to, uh, to, oh gosh, uh, online storage, uh, uh, dating profiles, 
financial matter, gaming, such as Fortnite, uh, music, uh, other entertainment products, et cetera. Anything that's a digital record, we can handle. That is that is really, really neat. Stan, what questions do you have? Yeah, so I have a lot of questions. So would that include my Delta SkyMiles account? If it's online, yes. Now, what Delta will do with the points, that will be up to Delta. In other words, some organizations may allow them to be transferred. Other ones may limit it to a donation to charity. Other organizations may say you can't transfer any miles. They just get deleted at the end of the year we do we will then provide them with what information we have so they can take that action as according to their own protocols so the way the relationship would work between your, your company dcs uh, and let's say my law firm for example or a financial advisor who's listening to this podcast uh, we would bring a client to your product we would introduce your your pro your product to our client Right. And then our our client, we would sign our client up for a subscription to your product. Right. Am I getting this right? You would enroll the client. You would provide us certain information such as name, address, phone number, email address. And if you're a lawyer, you could provide us the legal fiduciary to their trust or their estate. And then who who would maintain the and update this information? Would it be the law firm would it be the financial advisor would it be the client or would it be all you know all of us at different times it would from an account portfolio perspective meaning your linkedin accounts and your assets and other digital property that would be the client's responsibility and in fact we advise lawyers not to do that not to enter the data for on behalf of the client because if they get it wrong it gives the family or the estate the ability to go back and say you lost that asset you didn't enter it properly that makes sense so yeah. beyond oops, sorry stan go ahead no 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 go ahead so it's from your website which has a lot of great information and for our listeners we will link that for you but it also shows that you have monthly webinars as well what kind of education and training do you provide through through those webinars for the clients we give them a walkthrough of how to use the platform show them all the features the benefits and the tools they can use to optimize their experience with dcs for the for the financial advisor or the law firm we not only provide that kind of experience but we're able to demonstrate the value that we bring to that firm and the protection we bring to that firm so we walk them through an informational and educational presentation, as well as a demo of the service. Most people are not familiar to the depths of digital property, not only in terms of volume a client may have, but in particular for law firms, how digital property, property is now changing yeah. the wording in the provisions that, a, that must be included in the state documents. For example, Ancestry.com, or 23andMe is really wonderful at providing your heritage. So you can learn whether you're Asian, you're from Africa, you're from Europe. And it also provides to most people their lineage. So they'll say, we have five matches of your DNA. Well, that can surprise many people to understand that their, their parents that they knew their entire life may not be their biological father or it may not be their biological mother. They have been unknowingly, let's say, adopted. And we have seen where that can pose problems for an estate because now, a, for example, a child may lay claim to a deceased parent's estate having never had a relationship with that person. So the wording now in documents really has to be clear and spelled out. Is it a living child, known child, Maybe you need to name all the children so that anybody that might show up at last minute may now be eliminated from laying claim to the estate. So we can see how that's changing. Another prime example of this, uh, where we, dem we walk through this in the webinars, and we even just recently had one outlining exactly how digital property is changing wording and documentation. And it's interesting for financial advisors to know this as well. 
for, uh, there is a new product out here called with personal avatars, video recordings and artificial intelligence. So I can record myself with cameras in a three dimensional view and through artificial intelligence based on all my com uh, statements and recordings, it will know my inflections in my voice, my intonations and pronunciation. It can replicate who I am so that in years from now, through AI again, my great grandchildren can have a conversation with me as if I'm in the room. So great grandpa Lee, what was it like growing up in upstate New York? And I can tell them it was a great experience. We had Fryhofer cookies and it will be like I'm there. How does that change the wording in a document? Well, coming from a business perspective, I can imagine casting agencies opening up in Los Angeles and New York, buying the rights to my personal avatar or holographic image that can then be used in film, education, product support, or even political events. But I would wanna be able to control the use of my image in certain matters. So we wanna have now language for just a layperson. It's not just for celebrities in how do we use that image? I don't wanna be used in promoting certain political viewpoints. I don't wanna be known for promoting products that are fly-by-night operations. I may wanna say, I don't wanna be featured in, in adult films. So you could see how quickly digital property no longer is just an asset like a bank account, but it can command a different way of thinking for the law firm and the financial advisor and how to, how to plan ahead for the financial advisor, if I'm somewhat popular, or I'm a social media influencer, I may now wanna take into consideration that when I'm doing risk management for retirement funds or a state manage, you know, or what's gonna be passed on to heirs. So it applies to pretty much everybody involved in wealth management of legal estate planning or even insurance if they come into the picture. You're really, you're opening my mind to a whole, uh, you're, you're saying things that never, Lee, never honestly occurred to me as being possible. But I, you know, I am hearing that AI does some amazing things, and so this this isn't something we're talking about a hundred years from now. This is actually on the horizon, right? It's he, it's here. It's it's here. You're absolutely right, Stan. If we look at something like Open Chat, which is the latest technology innovation that's really taken the industry by storm, in a matter of seconds. I can create intellectual property that I have a right to that somebody may wanna buy. That's gotta be protected. I could create my own autobiography. I can write a script. I can write advertising in a matter of seconds and it has value. It has emotional value for friends and family, has financial value. Now imagine in just probably, it's already somewhat here, but it's gonna be even more robust shortly is visual open chat AI, meaning I'll be able to just dictate what I want for a video, what I want for artwork, what I want for NFTs. Now that will have even more value. So it's here today. We just have never thought about it in the world of trust in estates. And so we're going to get left behind and it's going to leave, unfortunately, professional advisors in a vulnerable position because if things like domain names get lost and they have value of 10, 12, $15 million and they're lost because of, of not being planned properly, one can easily draw the line to see that in a, uh, the heirs or the family may say, we're going after the, the law firm or the advi advisor for not planning properly, particularly when there's fiduciary access laws in certain states. So Lee, you mentioned crypto earlier. I'd like to drill a bit deeper into that. And I'm thinking about that this week because I had a client meeting just a couple of days ago with uh, with a client that had a really significant uh, crypto account. And, uh, um, and you know, I know that, uh, I don't know a lot about crypto, but I, 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 do, I do know that if you, if you lose the code, that, that account is really lost forever. Right, it's it's yep. <clears throat> it's beyond beyond access to anybody. So, talk a little bit more about about how you how you help clients preserve and protect that, so that if something happens to them, their crypto account isn't 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 lost to the people they care about. 
Well, their crypto and, and NFTs really fall in the same category for the purposes of this discussion. Um, it's a very delicate asset. We do a lot to protect it while we're alive. And even then it can be very delicate to us. There's a young man somewhere who's got $250 million in his personal wallet, which is a small device. And that device was designed to only allow someone 10 attempts to get into the device, to get access to the contents of that device. He's used up, he has used up eight of them. So he's got $250 million he can't access because he can't remember his password, which I, I would, I'll take that guy to have a cup of coffee just because I feel so bad for him. But we, uh, we recognize there are all different types of ways to protect our assets in the crypto world or the blockchain world. And before we talk about full protection, we have to talk about what are the security methods that are available. One is we have a personal wallet in a device where it creates a, a unique key and we get access to it and it's kept inside a personal device. So it's with us or someplace we place it physically. The others are what they call exchanges. Now, most people know Coinbase as the most popular crypto exchange. And that is a financial institution. So they have protocols and processes in place for trust and estates so that if a client loses access to their key, they have, they have alternative methods that can get to those assets. But then you have other exchanges that may be gaming platforms like Fortnite, where those assets are kept, but they're not financial institutions. So they never prepared for alternative access to the asset. So when we look at trust and estates in terms of crypto, we have to address each one of these areas independently so that they can each be prepared for properly. In the case of a personal wallet, what we recommend is to put that wallet in a safe deposit box at a bank, and then within DCS, identify where the wallet is and get allow somebody the contents to get into that, into that safe deposit box where the password and the key may reside. For the exchanges with Coinbase, we're gonna capture that account and we'll be able to assist with certain information to acknowledge the, the passing and <clears throat> otherwise who is to get the contents of that account. Now you have to be also careful there because getting access or disclosure to the contents of an account may be different than the distribution of the assets of financial value that are called for in the trust or the will. So you want, we want to try to make sure they match up as close as possible. The third one, which is the most difficult, is the exchange that is not a financial institution. Let me take one step backwards. Organizations like Coinbase that are financial institutions eventually will turn up an account that has no activity as abandoned property and will turn it over to the state. With game like Fortnite, they're not financial institutions and thereby don't have to turn over the property as abandoned at some point in the future. Literally, if nobody knows that that account exists or the assets within exist, they will disappear and vanish. So if you have a Bruno Mars video worth five or $10,000 inside the game and nobody knows about it, there's no way to access that video and then sell it on the open market to get the family the value of that. So we have to, what we do in that case, DCS, we capture the account in our automated fashion. The client can then designate who's to see what contents are in there. And uh, they will, we will have the data as required by the fiduciary access laws, as well as documentation at the time of passing, we gather with the representative and we're able to access those contents, get them disclosed and delivered to the designated beneficiary of that contents. This, so is, this want... is fascinating. My, sorry, Stan, my mind yeah. is, Spinning yeah, yeah, and stand no well okay I have a couple I'm not going to get in the way of that go for it <laughs> okay no I just have uh my mind is spinning for me personally you know I I have quite a bit invested in Fortnite Minecraft Pokemon Go right obviously a teenage boy mom um but my mind is spinning thinking through the way this service can be so seamlessly incorporated into something like 
uh, a law firm or a financial advisor could use it, uh, maybe an insurance agent. I mean, there are so many practical applications. So my question for you is, let's say our law firm, uh, the, the client gets access to the service through our law firms, so the law firm pays for that. Is that something if the law firm stops paying for that or their client leaves the law firm, what happens to their account with DCS? So once the client's enrolled by, uh, through the law firm through DCS, depending on what the law firm wants to do, whether it's a transactional based law firm or a client cares or maintenance program or a financial advisor, they can decide whether they want to continue to pay the subscription price of $50 per year for the client or the client should pay on their own. Okay. Uh, and so the client will stay with us. The key here is the first year enrollment. If the, the law firm enrolls and pays for their client, there is good standing ground where the, if something were to happen with digital assets and the family decided to pursue court claims or actions, the firm can say, hey, we gave you best practice or your parents best practice and they chose not to use it. But we were there, we gave them digital asset protection. And so thereby, if that domain name is lost, we gave it to them, they chose not to use it. Now, what DCS does is we put the responsibility of data accuracy and account accuracy back on the client. We can't know if they have accounts, only they can tell us if those accounts exist and what's in them. So we also take the liability and kind of put it back onto the client to make sure their records are complete. So that way, when the court action comes, if it does, everybody's about to say, well, it was supposed to be uh, kept maintained by the client. If they didn't do it, there's nothing we can do. But that makes if, so, had, if we were there, so, we would be able to do what we need yeah, to do. So, so following up on Katie Beth's question, when a client dies, let's assume the client has taken responsibility for maintaining the subscription with DCS. When the client dies, uh, they're probably not going to keep paying for that. I'm guessing, right? Because they're well, deceased. No, yeah, no, no. <laughs> it would be great. It would be a great business model if we get people to pay after they die. That would be fantastic. Right, yeah. <laughs> but no, what ends up happening, once the client passes away, uh, we work with the, fidu the representatives and the fiduciaries. So we partner with them into carrying out those directives. Now we charge an estate administration fee because that's where we do the heavy lift. And so we uh, charge up, up to approximately $600 to carry out as many accounts as that client has in the system. They can have 30, they can have 3000, we don't care. So what we'll do is gather the documentation required. In many cases, it could be obituary. It's definitely a death certificate letter of authorization, et cetera, whatever may be necessary. We have the data such as the username and uh, other information. We also have many cases, the logs of logging in, logging out, and we have always the decision points. So we can go back to Facebook and say on, Mar on April 11th at 1241 PM East Coast time, Lee Poskenter made the decision to have his wife, Rita Cohen, be the digital legacy content manager, as well as the distribution of all the contents to her. So we have all of that information. And because we know the custodian's submission methods, we wrap it up, we've automated the process, and we make it very easy to carry it out, which is why we've been successful to 100% of our clients' uh, goals being achieved to this date. Our system, our platform was designed with direct input from Facebook, from AOL, Verizon, and Yahoo, as well as Google. So the big leaders in the industry helped design our platform so that they would carry out the directives. So I'm Lee, sure that, sorry, sorry, we both have so many questions for you. Go ahead. I know, Sam. I know, right. Yeah. So my, my, my question is, and I think I know the answer to this, but I, I, I think every account would be an individual account, right? My wife and I would not have a joint account. I'd have an account and she would have an account also, I guess, right? That is correct, which is why DCS is based on the individual and not the marriage. Because when yeah. we sign the terms of service agreements that we never read, but we sign them, they have, many times they have very clearly laid out the protocols for handling an account holder's death. So we have to work with the individual who 
agree to that contract that remains in force even after death. And 99% of those contracts prevent or prohibit the use of sharing passwords or login credentials. So we not only have the individual accounts, but we really can't share passwords. It's a violation of laws and a violation of uh, privacy in terms of service agreements. And most people don't realize that if we share them because we think our spouse has a right to get into those accounts and they can't answer the security questions or they can't handle, get to the code because it's locked on a phone that somebody else has, then all of a sudden, after multiple attempts, it looks like hacking to the custodian. And in one case, Google sent the police to the home of the spouse of an individual because they tried to get into the account so frequently. And so, yes, it's all based on the individual for those purposes. From from the legal side of things, I'm just thinking about the, the post-death administration process and how this would really expedite, especially as we move into a continuously more digital world, how this would expedite uh, a lot of things, including making sure that after you think everything's done, there's not another account that pops up later that we then have to go back through and, and work through and all of those things. Has that been your experience so far? Well, you know, you bring up several points that really should we should touch upon. One is for the average person in our time trial studies, it takes about two and a half hours for a family member to to identify the account, deal with the customer service person after they spend hours finding them. And then that's before they get to look through the, the data. They have to figure out how to receive it. So you're looking at the average person having well over 200 accounts now, if it takes you two and a half hours, you're looking at 500 hours just dealing with everything from a dating profile or maybe something that's old and antiquated that you're just wanting to get off the net because you don't want somebody to, uh, to commit cyber crimes or cyber fraud. So we do see that the time saving there is, amazing, is incredible. But we also see the emotional hardship we recently settled in a state that had over 100 accounts. Unfortunately, the, the decedent had committed suicide and his wife really wasn't, for better lack of words, in the mood to really deal with anything. There were a couple of accounts she personally had to deal with that were pure financial matter outside the realm of DCS services. And she had said that if she had to deal with all those accounts in retelling the story to the customer service rep of her husband committing suicide, she wouldn't have been able to handle it. Not only she wouldn't have been able to handle it emotionally, but think about the delays, the procrastination. It's already overwhelming enough to do with enough of the administration. Now you're gonna to have to avoid it even more. And yet, if you're dealing with Dropbox and a, fo a folder in Dropbox has stock certificates, you're now looking at funds not being distributed. And if that account goes 18 months without activity, there's a good chance that Dropbox will say, we're gonna delete the data. And with everything being digital, that means stock certificates on non-dividend paying stocks can just disappear and they'll never come up as abandoned property. And so we see that administration aspect, a really a lifesaver on, our, on the back end for the family, for the lawyer, for everybody involved in doing administration work or settlement work. Uh, that uh, all of this is just it, it's really mind blowing and, and so unique and something that I feel like is very much needed, as I said, in the the world that as we continue to make everything more online and more digital, I'm just thinking through for me personally and then for our clients as well, how useful a service like this can be and could be easily incorporated into a client care program as well. Very fascinating. Is is there anything that we didn't talk about that you would like our listeners to know about? The only thing I would say is we see a lot of lawyers waiting for clients to ask about digital property. You can't, you can't do that. Or putting in overly simple uh, provisions that don't meet the are you fate or the fiduciary access laws or because they don't necessarily identify the user, tying them to the decedent, tying them to the URL, there's gaps there. And so we have heard directly from Google, from Facebook and several others that they deny access to contents for these reasons. And lawyers, 
will believe that their provisions will work. But when I say, have they worked in the past? Many of them say, we haven't gotten there yet. And it becomes very speculative. And that can be very dangerous to a family that's counting on the lawyer to carry out their goals. And if they don't meet it, um, then there's failure. The other thing that I really wanna specify and identify is disclosure of an account's contents is not gaining access to the account. Custodians will data dump all the records into a cloud-based file, giving the designated beneficiaries access to that file. They do not want them going in and behaving as if they're the client or the account holder, excuse me. You can see very quickly how that could be a great environment for fraud. If you're Amazon and somebody has the password or can get in, they can do a lot of shopping within the first 24 hours after death, get the product delivered to the person's home, pick it up off the porch, all before the estate even had a chance to cancel the credit card. And Amazon's gonna say, we saw that the password was used and they're gonna say, we're not liable. So now you're going back to the credit card company and the credit card, I, credit card company I have heard now is starting to say, not gonna be covered because the password was shared. So they won't help you in terms of getting access, but they won't help you in preventing fraud from taking place, the, the different entities. So we wanna make sure we understand that nobody wants anybody else using credentials to go in and behave as a client. No custodian wants anybody going in and behaving as a client. They want a data dump and then have the estate go look through it. Fascinating. Fascinating. Lee, thank you so much. This has given us all and our listeners as well a ton to think through. And so thank you for this. I've, I've really enjoyed it. For everybody listening in, this has been the Legacy Leaders podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today was Lee Poskanzer. And for more information on Lee or the work that he does through the Directive Communication Systems, visit directivecommunications.com. We will also link it for you guys in the show notes. We'll see you next time. And Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. This was a, an exciting time. Thank you. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.